Narzissan Cruz the Dragon, Jacob the Special One, and the Holy Blade that could cut out one's will so they could never receive the worst thing in the world, a vision. The story of the Narzissan Cruz Order and Institute is one of friendship, sacrifice, psychological torture, and a radical attempt to save the world. This is the unlikely Genshin Gamer, and I have gathered and pieced together this wonderful story for your enjoyment. Grab a cup of tea and a macron or two, and listen to the story of Narzissan Cruz. There will be spoilers, of course, for the entire chain of quests pertaining to this group, but this is a rare instance wherein you may prefer to tackle these quests after this video. The artifacts, weapons, diary entries, and confusing dialogue make far more sense afterwards. Now that that's out of the way, let's begin. Our story begins far back in the past, some years before the fateful event known as the Cataclysm, in which so many souls were lost. In Fontaine's history at that time, an incident was unfolding in the poverty-stricken underbelly of the court of Fontaine. The Fleur of Sonder Where the children's faces were stained with ash and oil, and their parents worked themselves ragged to provide for them. The thieves could thrive in the numerous shadows, and reformed convicts preferred the struggles and uncertainty to the posh unfairness of the overworld. But this haven of crime and struggle was also the product of the overworld's drive for perfection of their gem of a city. And eventually, that drive reached the doorsteps of the Fleur of Sander anyway. The very cesspool of rejection they had created. The incident was known as the Purge of Fleur of Sander. An attempt to disperse, or perhaps eradicate, the last of the dross of the Court of Fontaine and it served as a catalyst for many other tragedies that occurred afterwards. The good man of the people, Eduardo Baker, who had protected many a merchantman or family from the ruthless gangs and the crocodiles, swung his infamous ferryman in protection of the people again during that purge, but was powerless to prevent the massacre that occurred and was arrested for his troubles. He was sentenced to exile in the desert. But the Maison Guardianage underestimated the power of the support of the common folk. The entourage that carried Eduardo and his accomplices away to be deposited in Sumeru's red sands were ambushed on the slopes of Mount Otomnek, and Eduardo's men rescued him, taking the Maison Guardianage with him as hostages in Poisson. There they made a stand, making unreasonable demands of the authorities and preparing to defend their position. Eduardo was reunited with his sensitive young son, Jacob Baker, and other friends and acquaintances who believed in the resistance of the court's unfair treatment of the poor. One of which was Carl Ingold. Carl did not so much believe in violence as the answer to the problems of the impoverished, but instead being a journalist who took pride in his photography, he was that hopeful voice of the resistance who carried the news back and forth between Poisson and the Court of Fontaine for months, optimistic that a diplomatic resolution would prevail, until it didn't, and everything inevitably fell apart. The siege of Poisson became a black mark on the court's history. Needless destruction, death, and regret were inflicted during that event. Friendships were broken that day, residents burned to death, and many children became orphans, some of which would go on to wrought massive change in Fontaine's future or commit heinous crimes. Carl sadly gave up on journalism after the disaster of Poisson, and would eventually go on to look after two of the youngsters orphaned that day, Eduardo's son Jacob and his friend René de Petricor, the prodigious son of the late mayor of Poisson, Renault. But before taking on the Ingold name, 
Renee and Jacob would meet two other diamonds in the rough, Alan and Marianne, during their eventful stay at the Narcissan Cruz Institute. The Narcissan Cruz Institute was an establishment designed to nurture and educate Fontaine's orphans, many of which came to be during the siege. But the Institute had already produced prominent names before that influx of orphans, including Carl Ingold and Dwight Lasker, the latter of which would go on to become the director of the controversial Institute of Natural Philosophy. But another such person was Madame Basil Elton, the admiral of Fontaine's prestigious navy, the White Armada, and her own ship, the Sponsian, was the pride of the navy. Her power and skill were such that long before her appointment as admiral, Basil once beat back the mystical Fontimer Aberrant, the emperor of fire and iron, and sent it retreating back to the depths of the sea. After her retirement and the eventual disbanding of the Navy in those times of relative peace, she was nominated to become vice director of the very institute she grew up in due to her exceptional moral character. And although she was at first skeptical of the idea, she grew to cherish the position. Under her watchful eye, René, Jacob, Alain, and Marianne flourished and grew, just like the unruly flowers Basil would often compare them to. They became particularly fond of creating wonderfully fantastic stories of the evil dragon who would threaten the noble princess and her loyal knights who would save her with great pomp and sacrifice. Oftentimes, René played the part of the infamous dragon Narcissus, a title that would follow him far into adulthood. The children's games were often very engrossing and rowdy, and at one point, Basil had a special wooden sword made for them to spear the broomsticks and laundry poles that would often get damaged. The children then named it the Holy Blade of Narcissus Cruz. Sometimes, the princess to be rescued was Lyris, the Institute's actual director, though she held that title in name only. She was a kind but simple Oceanid, chosen not for her intelligence or ability to lead, but in honor of the first Hydro Archon, benevolent Egeria. Lyris couldn't count and was unable to properly understand cause and effect, but she was a loving companion to the children, and Marianne especially loved to read stories to her. Together, this cast of children and their loving caretakers lived and learned within the walls of the Institute, enjoying tea parties hosted by Miss Basil and acting out epic tales featuring Miss Lyris. Until disaster struck again in the form of the Cataclysm and Elinas the Dragon. As was the case in the rest of nations, Fontaine suffered terribly in the Cataclysm. Great, horrible sea monsters rose from the depths and terrorized the land, the chief of which was the mighty dragon Elinus. Judging from the sheer size of Elinus's skeleton, he was a gargantuan beast, and he roamed from island to island through Fontaine's water, destroying everything in his path. Seeing the impending doom, difficult decisions now had to be made. Lyris and other Oceanids like her left with Egeria to battle the darkness at its source in Sumeru. Vice Director Basil implored two of her closest friends to take on the responsibility of the children and take them far from the Institute lest harm were to befall them. Carl took in Jacob and Renee and so the little one of the group became Jacob Ingold, and Emmanuel Guillotin, another close friend from her childhood days in the Institute and a member of the Marichesso Phantom, adopted Alan and his younger sister Marianne. Then Carl took the two boys with him on an expedition away from Fontaine, and Emmanuel brought the young genius and his sister to the Marichesso. Basil Elton then took up her claymore one final time and boarded the newly refurbished Sponsian and Chase was made to kill the beast. The ship and its crew took on unimaginable damage 
following the beasts for 35 days, until Basil dismissed everyone who was not ready and willing to die on the ship in this final battle. Then, as the sinister fog rolled in across the water, hiding all but the nightmarish silhouettes of the sea monsters surrounding them, Basil, her first mate, and those brave souls who decided to stay fought on and eventually never came back. And the Sponsian was later found in two pieces, one at the bottom of the sea in the Elton Trench and the other half in the carcass of Elinus. Egeria, the Hydro Archon, died in Sumeru. Her body became a pool of pure dew called the Amrita, and it too would have wasted away under the onslaught of the abyss if it weren't for Ruka Devata, who before she too succumbed to the darkness, used the Kavarina energies shared with her from the late Mistress of Flowers to create the Harvest Stockham tree to anchor Egeria's consciousness to this world and to provide the brave warriors present, including Danesleaf and the Traveler's sibling, with the power they would need to fight back the abyss completely. After the clouds of destructive change had settled, the Institute was no more, having sunken into the sea, and those four children would embark on journeys of their own that irrevocably changed them, some for the better and others for the worse. Interestingly, the location where Carl Ingold took the two boys when they left from Fontaine was the Girdle of the Sands in Sumeru, where they studied the Great Lotus in Vorakasha Oasis, the site of the late Hydro Archon's consciousness. Rene, who was a frighteningly intelligent child, spent days noting the similarities between this remnant of their Archon and he and Jacob's bodies in particular. He hungrily digested Conrian research texts, showing particular interest in the research that was done into the similar yet opposing energies of the life-giving Kavrina and the Abyss. And there in those ruins, he began to deduce a working formula for calculating the onset of disasters such as what they had just lived through. He called this his world formula. The newly refined world formula revealed something terrible. Over and over he would recalculate the variables, and over and over they revealed the same result. Even young Jacob, when working alongside him, arrived at the same conclusion. A disaster even greater than the cataclysm was destined to befall the world again. Not so far in the future as one would hope. They even saw a visual manifestation of the hopelessly abandoned landscape, where not even a mint flower would grow. René was deeply troubled by this vision of destruction and was eager to share his findings with Alain when they returned to Fontaine so that together they could all find a solution to the impending problem. But before this, a troublesome incident befell the small group as they explored the Conrian ruins. During the expedition, poor little Jacob would quietly cry sometimes when considering the possibility that Lyris and Basil might not return, though Basil had promised she would. Renee was always patient and kind with him, instead explaining the knowledge he found and distracting him with ancient text, while hiding his increasingly dangerous research from Mr. Carl. But then one day, Jacob became terribly sick. And although we are not told what happened to cause this, we do know that Rene was desperate to save him. They were like brothers after all. And despite Carl's angry protests, Rene secretly employed the power of the abyss to do so. And surprisingly, it worked. Not only did it work, but Jacob began to change, seemingly for the better. He became physically stronger and healthier. He no longer needed to eat for sustenance. He could fight back numerous riff hounds alone while impeded by tears of fright. And he and Rene started to entertain the idea that perhaps the apocalypse could be survived in this way, if not averted.
I hope you're enjoying so far. If you're eager for part two, don't worry. It will be up very shortly. In the meantime, don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd like to see more of this. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the Genshin Wiki, which served as an invaluable resource during the creation of the script for finding, recording, and correlating all the scattered pieces of information pertaining to this quest and many others. Without the ability to read and reread these bits and pieces, this rendition of the story wouldn't have been possible. Thanks again to the editors. See you in part two.